Good morning. I'm Ned Kalanj. I'm President and CEO of the Colorado Trust. I want to welcome you to our first breakfast uh, version of the Health Equity Series and the first uh, learning series presentation in 2015. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few things I need to go over. Um, we are embarking on our new community partnership strategy. We're engaged and com committed to engaging all voices in health equity discussions. And today, we're going to learn more about how to engage communities to develop solutions around health equity. In addition to the presentation today, at your seats, we have provided a discussion guide. We hope you'll continue the conversation beyond today's event. We also have a survey for you could provide us feedback so that we can continue to improve. We've also put out copies of a new trust publication that summarizes the lessons and action items from our uh, 2014 Health Equity Learning Series presentations. We hope you'll find it useful in continuing the conversations in your groups around health equity. Materials will be posted on our website after the presentation today, including our publication and the slide deck and video from today's event. I also want to acknowledge our virtual partners. For the third year, we have selected grantee organizations to host events simultaneously in their communities as we live stream this event. Hundreds of people are now joining us online, and 27 organizations are hosting their own viewing parties in these Colorado uh, uh, communities across the state. So I want to welcome everyone that's not in the room. I'd also like to recognize that some of my bosses are in the room. R.J. Ross, Don Morris from our Board of Trustees. Those are the only two I saw. If I missed somebody, I apologize. And I want to welcome everyone else here as well. Following the presentation, we're going to continue the dialogue <clears throat> with the audience. For those of you streaming the presentation, please submit your questions via Twitter. You can follow the Colorado Trust and use the hashtag HealthEquityTCT. If you prefer, you can also email your questions to us at healthequity at coloradotrust.org. We will do our best to answer all the questions we can today, whether you're in the room or remote. So now I'm really pleased to introduce today's speaker, Doran Schrantz, Executive Director of ISAIA, a faith-based community organization of 100 member, organization, uh, member congregations in Minnesota. Ms. Schrantz has transformed ISAIA into one of the most powerful voices in Minnesota around issues of racial and economic justice. Isaiah has explored the intersection of community organizing, policy and research, and has launched powerful partnerships with national policy leaders. And we're really looking forward to learning from her today. Doran, please help. Thank you, everybody, and I want to thank the Colorado Trust for inviting me to be here today. I feel very privileged and honored to be here, and I'm looking forward um, uh, to actually learning from all of you uh, this, after, this morning about, about your work and what you're doing as well. So I'm just going to start, actually, to tell you a little bit more about myself. I come to you by way of Iowa. I, I live in Minnesota now, but I grew up in a little town on the border of uh, Iowa and Missouri, this town called Ottumwa, Iowa. Oh, someone from Ottumwa. <laughs> Actually, it shocks me. Almost every time I go someplace, someone knows Ottumwa, Iowa. The other claim to fame of Ottumwa, Iowa is that Rado O'Reilly from the show MASH, his hometown was Ottumwa, Iowa. So that's where I'm from. Um, I grew up there during the 80s. So while I was growing up, um, the elementary school that I went to, most of the kids, their dads worked at John Deere or they worked at Hormel, which was a meatpacking plant. And when I was in second grade, the union went on strike at the meatpacking plant. And this strike went on for over a year. People were out of work. It created an enormous amount of controversy and tension in our town. 
the uh, strike is, was actually connected to another labor strike that happened up in Austin, Minnesota. There's actually a great documentary about this strike called The American Dream. And a union lost. And all those workers lost their jobs. And they had to go, either they left town or they found some other way to make a living or they tried to go back to get their same job back but at probably half the wage. My friend's dad um, and I always went to their house because her mother made the most delicious peach pie. And my mother was not a baker, shall we say. And so I could get treats and all kinds of things at their house. And one, um, after this strike happened, I went to their house and I had dinner with them. And her dad had always been the most, he was a storytelling, charismatic, jovial, you know, powerful, amazing, funny person. And he would tell stories and kind of hold court at the dinner table. And from that point on, after he lost his job, he was completely silent. And he was ashamed. And when I was in um, college, I also had the experience of my mother coming all the way to college. My mother struggled with substance abuse and addiction as I was growing up. She struggled with depression. And she came to me to tell me her story about what had actually happened to her in her life. She was fought in, um, she was a nurse on the front lines of Vietnam. And what she told me was when she was a child in a small town, a lot like Atoma, she um, was sexually assaulted. And she had never told anybody about that. And she felt so much shame. I didn't know growing up or as I was becoming an adult what to make of these experiences. But I knew that the silence and the shame that happened to people around me that allowed them to be stripped of their humanity and left behind was wrong. And that's why I organize. So I've been organizing for 15 years. I came to it um, via, I was in Chicago, I went to school in Chicago and then I started organizing, um, community organizing in the city of Chicago. And then I discovered faith-based community organizing and I actually did not grow up as a person of faith, but I went to a leadership training that was hosted by faith-based community organizers. And um, my life was completely transformed by it. It's where I got clear about the story I just told you. It's where I began to understand who I really was and who I wanted to be. It was an extraordinary experience of finding my own voice. And from there, I went to work for Isaiah in Minnesota. Um, and I've been there for the last 12 years, and I've been director of Isaiah for four years. So that's how I come to you today. Now, if I can figure out PowerPoint. If any of you actually know organizers, we don't do PowerPoints. We have flip charts in the back of our cars, and we have, like, tubs filled with markers. <laughs> that's usually how we roll, so. <laughs> ah, okay, it's not working. Here we go. There. All right. So Isaiah is a faith-based community organization. Uh, we have 100 member congregations. So what being a member of Isaiah means is that a congregation pays dues, it decides to be a member of the organization, it's an intentional process. That, um, they have decided to become a stakeholder and owner of Isaiah, their organization, to have a voice. And our primary mission is to be a vehicle for people of faith and congregations to have a collective voice on racial and economic justice in Minnesota. And we are affiliated with a national network called PICO, People Improving Communities Through Organizing. You have one of the premier PICO organizations here in Colorado, Together Colorado. Yay. <laughs> I have been a longtime admirer of Together Colorado, and you're very lucky to have them here in the state. Um, but PICO is a network of 55 organizations like Isaiah and like Together Colorado, and it's where we can uh, both be trained and be together as organizers, and then we work on national issues um, and do national campaigns together. Okay. All right, so here's um, what, basically I'm gonna go through with you today. 
So one of the main um, topics I know uh, this uh, foundation is looking at and we've spent a lot of time thinking about is actually the intersection of what it means to create health and what that might have to do with organizing. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I have come into an understanding of health and how our work is actually about health um, and our definition of health. I'm gonna uh, then tell you about community organizing as I see it and some as we see it. It's not going to be the universal definition of all community organizing. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the intersections of health and, and organizing. So about, um, I would say about seven years ago, we had a woman who became active in our organization named Jean Ayers. She is now the Assistant Commissioner of Health for our State Health Department. At that time, though, um, she was a member of a Catholic congregation, and she has a long time history working in public health, and she became very interested in the intersection of organizing and public health. And um, I'm going to use a little bit of faith language here. She became an evangelizer inside our organization where she kept saying to us, you do not know it yet, but everything you're doing is about health. And I would say, I don't know about that. Why don't you turn out 100 people from your congregation to this meeting? <laughs> and over time, we came to a set of understandings about, about how, how we really did think about our work as health. And so she introduced me actually to some of these definitions. So the first one that I love is um, the World Health Organization, the social determinants of health. The social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, age, including the health system. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power and resources at a global, national, and local levels. Do you see the italics? The distribution of money, power, and resources. Here's one from the Institute of Medicine. Public health is what we, as a society, do collectively through organized actions to assure the conditions in which all people can be healthy through organized actions. Okay, so it's really hard to see this slide, but I'll explain it to you. So the other, um, this slide actually comes from uh, a man named Bobby Milstein. He worked for the CDC for many years. I was introduced to him in some of our work and exploration about thinking about what is health and how it connects to the work that we do. And so I uh, was introduced to this, this slide. Um, and I, I don't know if we, people might be able to get copies of the slide later. So this is basically what it says, though, and this is what's important about it. So if you see down here, it says afflicted with complications and um, dying from complications. If you start going upstream, it says afflicted without complications. And a lot of medical and public health work actually lives inside that circle. So you're de you know, we're dealing with the symptoms of, of illness, of what's happening to people. So what this is saying is, as a lot of people in this room know, if you go further upstream, you have vulnerable populations. So another way of talking about vulnerable populations is people who are experiencing societal uh, oppression or marginalization. Uh, and those vulnerable pop populations start to move down the path towards becoming afflicted without complications and move into complications. So it's almost like a pipeline that's getting built of people getting sick. And at the end is safer, healthier populations. So what, Ms. what Milstein is saying is if you look at that circle, how do you take people who are vulnerable, vulnerable because in a society, that is distributing resources and power uh, in a way that's inequitable, how do we actually move them not down that path, not be a pipeline to illness, but go back this way to create safer, healthier populations? And the circle is actually different work. It's different work than treating the symptoms of illness or even preventative pieces of illness. It's deeper prevention. And the words at the bottom at the bottom are democratic self-governance. So that is different work. And the question becomes, what does that work 
look like? How do we do the work of creating democratic self-governance in which people can protect themselves from, the, from conditions that make them ill? So, this is a simpler version of that story. So our health is created by our living conditions. It's created by uh, the environmental conditions, the built environment, whether or not we're poor, whether or not we're white or a person of color. All of these determinants are the things right now because of the way our society is structured make us on a path to health or on a path to illness. So if health is created by our living conditions, then how do we change the living conditions? The way we change the living conditions is we have the capacity to act to change them. Capacity to act. The question becomes who's acting? Is it people acting for somebody else? Is it experts acting? Is it only the smart people acting? <laughs> who's acting? Maybe these people are acting. <laughs> the question of what this work looks like is for a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of us in our society, we don't know what that work looks like. We might have all kinds of ideas about what it looks like, but I think it looks an awful lot like this. These are people acting and building their capacity to act to change the conditions in which they live so that they themselves can be on a path to health. Voting, canvassing your neighborhood, coming out for a march. So I sometimes joke about my job with my family, which is that everything that I do are all the topics you can't talk about at the Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Religion. <laughs> and politics, right? <laughs> so if we're gonna talk about who's acting, the distribution of money, power, and resources, you can't get very far down that road without beginning to think about politics and power. One of the things that we do very systematically in our work is that we have to reclaim words. So politics, in most of our experience, or the experience of people in an everyday way, is not something that serves their interests. It's something that happens on TV. It's something that happens in you know, negative ads between two people that you think aren't going to really do anything for you anyway. It happens if you decide you might go vote. You do one thing, and you go vote that year. And then you feel you know, like you did your duty, and then you go shopping. I mean, so. Politics has become a, either it's almost like a consumer-driven practice, like an individualized consumer practice. Or politics is seen as something that people who just are out for their own self-interest or for their own power at the expense of the many are operating to get accesses to resources, money, and power on their own behalf. These are things that we think about politics, and, and actually those that's a rational conclusion given what we see around us in the realm of politics. But we have to reclaim the word politics, and we have to reclaim the word power. So the word power means, in our definition in Isaiah, when we talk, to, we, we talk a lot about power. We talk about power all the time. Um, a woman uh, who works on our staff now is a master's in public health and came to work at our organization. We did a health impact assessment, and she ran that process. Now she's an organizer with Isaiah. We transformed her. And um, she joked with me about six months after she started working with Isaiah, we did a telephone interview, and she said she got off the telephone, and she turned to her husband, and she said, I have never heard anyone use the word power so many times in such a short amount of time. Because <laughs> that's what we talk about. We talk about power all the time. Power is the capacity to act. So in that living conditions, health, capacity to act, power, is a resource, and it gives you the capacity to act. We uh, want to run away from the word power because power is very abusive a lot of times. And we've all experienced the abuses of power. People have experienced extreme powerlessness. And so you think, 
Or you can think, let's put that in a box someplace. I don't want to have anything to do, it, do with it. But if we extract uh, all of the baggage around the word and say, but do we need the capacity to act? Did my mom need the capacity to act? Did those workers who, were, who lost their jobs in the meatpacking, do they need the capacity? Do they get to have that? Does Martha, who the picture you just saw, who spent, even though she can't vote, spent hours and hours and weeks of her time canvassing neighborhoods in her community to find the people who could vote so they could go vote with her. Vote for her, stand with her. That's the capacity to act. And she has the experience not only of, of like a policy change or something good happening in the world, but herself experiencing power as a person is also how we cultivate resilience and change and leadership. And it's in and of itself health, healthy. It's a healthy thing for someone to feel themselves having the capacity to act. So that's power. So power operates in the realm of politics. And I, um, I think this is also a word that we have to reclaim. So the word politics up there has a small p. And we want to remember, what was where does that word derive from? What is it really about? So um, I, you'll have to forgive me. I, I took a lot of political philosophy in college. So I'm going to go back to the word polis. So that is a word defined by Aristotle. And what politics means is the political community. So political community is actually a space. It's not something that exists. It's a space. And it's the public arena. And it's where we come in to negotiate, decide, deliberate, debate. <laughs> we bring our interests. We come together to try to figure out, like, how do we find a better solution? It's where voice and public, um, public expression happens. The polis was considered the highest form of human freedom. We have lost that space. There's not, I mean, some people talk about the town square or the public square. We've ceded that space. And that's where people like me and people like you and people who don't think of themselves as political at all can have the experience of their own power and expression and capacity to act. That's what we have to reclaim about the word politics. So, um, at the bottom, these were all the uh, various powerful political philosophers I could think of in the moment, but we can make a list of everyone from Susan B. Anthony to Paulo Freire to Oscar Romero to Pope Francis to um, Aristotle, Arendt, Adams, Martin Luther King. What those struggles are about is people wanting to have the opportunity to be a political being, to have the capacity to act and be visible and seen, and our rights respected. So some would say that that participation, the ability to be in that space in an uncontested way, whether you are black or white, or a woman or a man, or have property or don't. So like in the founding of America, the only people who got to be part of the political community, that highest form of human freedom were white property men. So part of the struggle that we're in still, and we've been having for the last 250 years and longer than that, is who gets to be in the political community? Who is recognized and respected? That's part of the political struggle, and we're still in it right now. We're still with the Black Lives Matter movement, if people have been paying attention to that, that is about our, our people who are black in this country seen as citizens. Are they seen as a part of the political community or not? And the fact that that is still contested and it's debated on TV shows us where we are, right? So we are political beings. There is a part of us that emerges only to the extent that we participate in public life. So community organizing is a tepid set of words to describe that process. <laughs> so the thing about building the political community is that it doesn't just happen. The march that you saw, or the people sitting in rooms, or uh, the women with their clipboards, they didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to go canvas my neighborhood. 
That doesn't happen. Marches of thousands and thousands of people don't just happen. The, the fight of the dreamers to say, uh, we want access to go to college, that didn't just happen. <clears throat> it's something that we build and create. It's, it's, a, it's something that we construct. And it's important how we construct it. So community organizing is disciplined. It's a set of discipline and strategic practices to build democratic and collective power to assure the conditions in which a community or communities can thrive. This is not in a textbook anywhere in terms of a definition. Um, this is a definition that actually I made up. But, um, but what I want to underscore is disciplined and strategic. It's not, like I said about the weather, it's not the weather. People spend a long time trying to understand how to do this work and do it well. It's a craft. <laughs> it's something that we learn. It's not something that you just know. Um, and we are trying to build that kind of political space with a small p inside organizations and inside movements in which democratic and collective power can be wielded to produce change in the world, and so that the people who are a part of it are having their own experience of resilience, voice, and power in the process. That builds capacity. So, here are three strategies that community-based organizing does to do that public work. So if we go back inside that circle of what is the public work, these are ways that that public work happens and how it actually is work. So grassroots leadership development. So leadership development is another way of saying, or a way I would describe leadership development is it's the process by which a person prepares themselves and then enters into the political community with public skills. So public skills, again, are not something that we know how to do. I, I didn't have public skills when I first started doing this. Why, why would we learn how to be leaders, right? We learn how to run a meeting. We learn how to pull people together. We learn how to actually identify other people's interests and negotiate with them. We learn how to run money. We learn how to raise money. We learn how to have a meeting with an elected official. We learn how we get manipulated by elected officials, right? We learn. So we have to create an environment in which people have the opportunity to learn. And one of the first steps of entering into that learning process is what I did the first thing I started this meeting or this conversation, which is people learn to tell their stories. It's very important to know your story and to politicize your story. So the process of politicizing your story is a process of making meaning about how I was impacted in my life by the conditions around me, what it meant for me, and how it's a driver to wanting to publicly express an alternative picture, have the capacity to act and make something change. So we spend actually a lot of time with people. The organizers here, I know that that's what they do as well. You spend a lot of time with people working with them on their story. So what you see in this picture, um, anyone who's organized, um, it's a very familiar picture. Either you're in a VFW hall or a church basement or the YWCA or a community room someplace <laughs> with flip chart paper and markers and a bunch of people. I sometimes joke that pictures of activities in Isaiah look really boring, because really what it is, it's like, oh, there's some more people sitting in chairs, or like, there's some people in a meeting. What's going on in this picture is something we call a one-to-one -one training. So these are people coming together who actually get to rehearse their story. Where do I come from? Why am I here? What do I want? And then they engage in the practice of having that conversation with someone else. So who are you? Why are you here? What do you want? And we call that a one-to-one, -one, and it is the foundational building block of this kind of work. Because when I know who I am, and now I know who you are, not like, you know, all your deepest, dark secrets, but I know something about where you come, what's at stake for you. Now we can begin to build a relationship. We can begin to figure out where, where we have differences and where we have commonalities and where we can align. 
we build trust, we're able then to have those building blocks become the building blocks of collective and unified action. So grassroots leadership development is central. And since I'm here at a foundation, um, one of the things I'll say is, especially when um, philanthropy or political campaigns or um, you know, policy advocacy groups are focused on the question of passing a policy, say, like we want more funding for education or we want to build a regional transit system. If you're a successful community-based organization, what people notice about you is, boy, you can bring a lot of people to stuff. Can you bring all those people you have to my stuff? Is anyone familiar to anyone? Or we don't want to help you build the capacity. We'd like to buy your capacity so we can pass transit. But the work to create that space where you have 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 1,000 people, 2,000 people, 3,000 who can act in concert on their own behalf is different work. And it's work. It is not, not anybody can do it. <laughs> it's a field of practice. There are philosophies and methodologies behind it. There's different ways that people do it. People have to practice a craft for years to learn how to do it well. It's, it's the real work that creates something that is visible to the world as you just put 10,000 people in the streets. Or you just had a public meeting with 4,000 people and 300 congregations and the governor. That was years, that, that's years and sometimes even decades of work. Okay, I've made my point. All right. So um, the other piece about this is that community organizing and building that kind of capacity, part of the focus of what we're doing is building democratic, sustainable organizations. So another um, tension that can arise is the difference between community engagement and community organizing. So community engagement can look, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it can be a very good practice for an agency or a school or a foundation or, um, or a politician, you know, to, to say, we want to go and hear from the community about what you care about. So usually what that looks like is there's a notice put someplace and we're going to meet at the library and we want to hear what the community thinks about blah, blah, blah. That doesn't leave anything in its wake. So to have something that gets built that is a sustainable, independent, democratic vehicle through which this process of people building leadership and, and exercising their capacity to act is usually an independent organization. And it's an organization that its purpose is to keep building that capacity over, like, like just keep expanding that capacity. And then it can act collectively and independently negotiate its interest. That's different. It's different and it's longer term and it's sustainable and it does create a different relationship between then that organization and the public health department or that organization and the state capital or that organization and the local city council member because now they have something they have to negotiate with. That's <laughs> a different relationship than I'm a public official engaging the community. You see the difference? Lastly, our theory of change in community organizing is fundamentally grounded in a theory of power. That, that circle of democratic self-governance, it's saying that if people don't have the capacity to act, bad things will happen to them. If we do not have the capacity to assure the conditions in which we can be healthy, the conditions to be healthy will not be there. <laughs> And so we have to build enough power to change those conditions, to change the distribution of money, power, and resources. And so when uh, Kate on my staff said, I never heard anyone talk about power more than in those 20 minutes, we wanted our health impact assessment that we were doing to build power. We wanted 22 constituency-based organizations at the center. We wanted labor, African-American, the Hmong political organization, 
all the social service agencies, the local neighborhood organizing group to be together and at the center and the ones making the decisions. So when the health impact assessment was over and we could advance the recommendations with the city and there would be something left in its wake, some new political arrangement <laughs> on our central corridor that could advocate for itself over the next decade of building a light rail, not in the next, just in the next six months. Power. So this is another image of what I'm just saying. It's a visualization. These things work together. Grassroots leadership development builds the capacity to act. It, gets, it happens through building democratic, sustainable organizations where people are flowing in and out of those organizations. Um, and then that, that leadership development with the organization is what gives me then the capacity to act. I'm not then just an individual. I'm part of an organization. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a, an example of what can happen through this process of organizing. So um, this is from um, a program, this is from, I just said the thing about like a huge public meeting with the new governor. So our organization, uh, about a year, two years before we knew the next governor was gonna be elected, we asked ourselves the question, how do we want to be players in whoever the new next governor is. So we had strategy meetings that actually involved, you know, hundreds of people about what is it that we think is most important. Is our voice or what's our analysis of how much power we have now? What does our vision say about what we want? What's our agenda? And we decided to launch something that we called 10,000 Voices for One Minnesota. And what that meant was we actually, we're a nonpartisan organization, so we were not engaged in either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. So then the question becomes, if you're not giving money to a governor, <laughs> or you're not you know, working on their campaign, how do you have account an accountable relationship with them that's not contained by the electoral process? So we built, um, we first built an agenda that we felt like addressed the major crisis of our state. So the major crisis of our state is Minnesota, on one hand, is named like the number two best place to live. Some people would say it's number one. You know, Lake Wobegon, we're all rich and healthy and the women are above average and, you know, all that. I have my favorite pictures from a Time magazine cover where the governor, Wendell Anderson, is wearing like a plaid shirt and he's got a big fish and he's super healthy and strapping and smiling and the thing says, the good life in Minnesota except if you're black so, or, or a person of color. Life is not great in Minnesota. It's not great at all. We have the worst disparities in the country. In fact, we have worse outcomes for kids of color in education in Minnesota than they do in Mississippi. It's pretty bad. And we ha it's not that we don't have the resources. I mean, there's, there's, there's resources, there's capacity, there's resilience, there's all kinds of ways that, that this, there's no excuse, essentially, for this ever, but for the state to have that kind, of, that kind of crisis on its hand. So we decided, we thought that the next governor should talk about race. Which is something in Minnesota, for white people, is really hard. <laughs> it's true for white people, anyway. But, so, Minnesota, is like, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of white people there. So... <laughs> So um, it's been a majority white state for a long time, as is Scandinavian roots. Um, so how are we actually going to go through the process of, A, having our own conversation as an organization about race, right? That's not just that we want someone out there to do it. Like, we're going to have, we have a lot of Lutherans and Catholics, a lot of white people part of our organization, a lot of African-American congregations and Latino congregations, but we've never really done our own work of creating a political community that has race and multiracial democracy at the center of that. What does that look like and what does it mean for our leadership and how do we change ourselves around that question? So that was the first thing that we did was we started, we started um, looking at ourselves really deeply. Secondly, we found some things in that process that we felt like other people would get something out of. We created something that we called the opportunity story. So it was where we took one-on-ones, but we said, let's not make it race neutral or gender neutral. Let's actually have people talk about their situatedness in the context of doing one-on-ones. And so we have described these things called opportunity stories, which is people identifying where they were sitting. Well, I got my farm 
in, you know, 18 whatever, oh, that came from the, oh no, bad history. What was that called? You know, where they gave away the land for a dollar? If you, what? Homestead Act. Yeah, Homestead Act, thank you very much. So the Homestead Act, we had people actually think about what, what did it mean that you actually got a piece of land? <laughs> years ago. Does that say something about the wealth gap in Minnesota? That some people were given a piece of land for a dollar? So what does that mean that people migrated here from the South to get work in the factory jobs who were African American and then those jobs left? Like that, that's the conversation we actually have to have with each other. So then we decided to create house meetings and we were, our goal was to involve 5,000 people in house meetings and 125 congregations across the state. So we built a program, we trained hundreds of house meeting captains, we uh, had all kinds of opportunities with those people to build their leadership so they could run a house meeting in their congregation. The house meeting had a little video, it was people telling their opportunity stories and talking about race, and then beginning to think about what's our health and transportation and education agenda if we're gonna put closing the racial equity gap in the state at the center of the next governor. And then everybody in the house meeting wrote a postcard to both gubernatorial candidates to say, if you are elected, will you come and meet with us? So there was an action that people took in the House meeting. So we did that whole process. We engaged 5,000 people um, in person in House meetings, plus we did postcard campaigns that actually moved thousands of more postcards. We had public actions where we delivered those postcards. We wrote memos on all the issues that we cared about with different leadership teams across the organization. And then our goal was whoever was gonna be elected, we wanted a meeting right after the election with um, delegations from each of these congregations, all of the bishops in the state, and the tr entire governor's transition team. Because part of our goal was to say, we wanna be at the table when you pick your commissioners, we wanna be at the table when you decide what your agenda is. And um, Governor Dayton was elected. There was a recount, there he is right there, that's Governor Dayton. So we landed a commitment from Governor Dayton we brought him into the Minnesota, Minneapolis Convention Center. We had uh, close to 2,000 people in the room. We actually did it in the round, so there was like a platform in the middle, and the rest of the group was in a circle, like 2,000 people in a circle around Governor Dayton and his transition team. And then we um, had, uh, this, is, this right here is Grant Stevenson. Um, he's a Lutheran pastor, so he was there making sure Governor Dayton didn't talk too long. And um, that man in the glasses is named Lee Sheehy. He was the chair of the transition team for Governor Dayton. And there's Governor Dayton right there. And then next to them is Pastor Paul Slack. He is the president of Isaiah. And so then Pastor Paul, the way we organize it, he um, chaired two tables publicly. It was like in the round, accountable, transparent. We had a conversation on education equity and the failure of our public schools to educate kids of color. We had a member of the teachers union on the stage <laughs> with a member of um, uh, the education department with a school principal who, uh, and members of ours who then told stories and then we modeled this is how people come together to, in political community to solve a problem. We did that also on jobs and economic development. We had the Carpenters Union up there. We had the head of the Minnesota State Baptist Convention. We had um, the guy from the Minnesota Department of Transportation who was at the Civil Rights Department. Then we wrote memos to the transition team. And then the funniest thing happened. Pastor Paul, about two days after this meeting, and myself got phone calls from the chairs of the transition team wanting to vet their candidates for commissioners by Isaiah. And we were a part of choosing four of the top commissioners of his administration. The Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Health, the Education Department, and the Transportation, the Department of Transportation. Our um, main ally was made commissioner of the Department of Health, and then Jean Ayers, that same woman who showed me these slides seven years ago, is now assistant commissioner. She was on the Isaiah board at the time. Roxanne Smith, who's another longtime leader, was appointed to the Metropolitan Council. We had strategy meetings. We wrote, you know, we wrote memos. We did, the, we did the whole thing. It was a shocking experience for all of our leaders of this is what can happen when you build enough power. This is my favorite headline that I've got. So, faithful tell Dayton, erase gaps. <laughs> 
This was on the front page of the Star Tribune. Um, okay. So now I'm going to tell you one more brief story. That is a story about building a base and advancing an agenda. Um, this story, I'm gonna, it's, just a, it's, it's more about like what is the connection then between our relationship with that Department of Health that we had a power relationship with as an organization as a result of this work, and then what we could do together. So we were in a fight the last few years to raise the minimum wage in Minnesota. There had been multiple attempts to raise it. It was never quite got over the hump. It never, to be honest, had much of a base behind the campaign. So there was a lot of inside game advocacy going on, but there was not a lot going on in the streets. There was not a lot going on in the neighborhoods. There was not a lot of like pe regular people showing up to the Capitol and saying this is what they wanted. So we began to, together, this is not Isaiah, it's Isaiah and a whole group of organizations began to construct a campaign to raise the wage in Minnesota. And we built a part of Isaiah's contribution. Well, here's a... Here's some pictures. So there's Grant, again, who you saw on stage with Governor Dayton. Now he's standing in front of McDonald's um, talking about raising poverty wages. He's there with um, fast food workers and um, members of SEIU and Neighbors Organizing for Change, which is one of, another one of my favorite, most powerful, amazing groups in Minnesota. Um, that is Saytool up there, which is a worker justice center. They just won a contract negotiation with Target, which is one of the biggest uh, and they have, talk about power and chutzpah, they probably have 60 workers. And that's how much hard they fight that they beat Target. And that was the announcement of their deal with Target. Um, and then there's Governor Dayton signing the minimum wage bill into law. So, yay. <laughs> so the campaign then aligned all these groups. So Isaiah was, so, so if we were going to like make it a big thing, right, we had workers from Saytool and the fast food workers and neighbors organizing for change and the labor unions and um, Isaiah and our base of people all like began to work on this and go public, right? Like we had fights in McDonald's, we did sit-ins, we did a march with 2,000 people and took over an intersection. And we did some darn good policy work and inside game lobbying, and we married those things together. And it's when you marry them together that something can happen. So the Department of Health played a critical role in the Raise the Wage campaign. We worked with them, um, Gene and Commissioner Ed Ellinger. Ed Ellinger is the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health, to say, we know this thing is coming down the pike at the state legislature could you guys come out and talk about the connection between health and income? And they said, I think we could do that. So they worked with uh, people all across the country. They pulled together this, so if anyone here is in public health, you know the data is not that hard to get your hands on, right? Um, they got the data, they put it into like a five or six page, well, it's like 14 page, but they had an executive summary that was five or six pages, and then they hosted a press conference with the workers from Saytool, members of Isaiah, other organizations to say, here's the data, here is the crisis we're facing in our health if we don't raise the wage. And then that stage, the way that we did that is that there were squishy votes on the uh, Senate Health Committee. So the reason we invited the Department of Health to do this is they were able to impact votes on the Senate Health Committee and it leveraged a hearing in the health committee of, this, of the, our, house, our, um, our state senate to have a conversation about income and health. And then um, Commissioner Ellinger sat at tables with the workers from Saytool. They did editorials in the paper. It got covered actually all across the state in about 50 papers, this report that the commission, and, and what was funny about um, Commissioner Ellinger is he said, well, we've known this for years, but no one's ever reported on it before. <laughs> And it was that partnership between our organization and the Department of Health using their power in a different kind of way than they had used it before to advance a narrative and a story about the connection between health um, and work and organizing. So last piece, I want to talk a little bit about how all of this is, um, how we're thinking about some of this all together as PICO. So, um, Together Colorado is here in the room. Um, there's 55 organizations. Health has actually been something that PICO has worked on collectively for many, many years, um, including passing um, S-CHIP at a national level, children's health insurance, um, 
PICO was one of the major forces in fighting for affordability in the Affordable Health Care Act. I'm not a health care policy wonk, but their main, the main focus of us in PICO was making sure that we made sh that, that the insurance and was going to be affordable and looking out for the people who are the most low income and most needed access to health insurance. Um, and also worked on this aspect of public health and health equity. So together we're building something we're calling the Power to Thrive, <laughs> or the PICO Center for Health Organizing. And it's saying over the next decade, as we think about that pipeline of illness, and we think about the rising costs of healthcare, and all the people who are gonna be coming into the system, how do we make it sustainable? And how do we ask a set of questions about democracy and organizing on the process at all those levels? So we're both lowering, we're getting everybody in, we're lowering costs, and we're making sure people are less sick. <laughs> And so we think about that as these three intersecting um, circles. And then here's a little um, window into some of the questions that we're asking. So whether we're talking about um, like the hot spots campaign that's happening here in Colorado that J uh, Dr. Jeffrey Brenner has been working on in New Jersey to um, take use organizing strategies to engage people who are high users of the health system in a democratic process and a leadership process to say, what do you actually need? <laughs> what is the real problem here? And so that people are not immediately going to the emergency room, but maybe they need a nurse practitioner in there or childcare, or we need to actually, um, uh, actually a campaign we did in Isaiah was um, people, uh, the big uh, town high raise was right on the highway and there was no walking path to get from, to the road from the high rise that had about a thousand Somali families that lived in it. And so the moms had no place to take their kids or to walk them anywhere. So we started working on how do we build a park? So those are some of the ways, questions that we can ask, even in things like the complexity of how we deliver healthcare, to think about where organizing and the capacity to engage people um, and build power can actually um, help change systems. So, how, do we, how are we creating pathways for people to act with agency and power around their own interests and agenda? Whether we're talking about the delivery system or expanding Medicaid or working on public health. A really important question to ask is who has the power to decide? In any situation that you're in, one way to get focused on the question of power is who's deciding? Um, and how are we shifting the arrangements of power. So if we go back to that WHO, if we're actually, if we're moving a process um, uh, to engage people or to change something, we have to ask ourselves the question, at the end of the day, did we shift the arrangement and distribution of money, power, and resources, and who has the power to decide? Because that's what's gonna make things sustainable for the long term. So, um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll end. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, and the next, we're gonna do questions and discussion. Okay, thank you. I, Isaiah has a lot of organizations, a lot of congregations, and a lot of people. And um, maintaining momentum and enthusiasm in uh, community organizing is one of the hardest challenges that you face. Mm -hmm. So I wonder with all of those congregations and all the people, how, and an agenda that, that actually has a lot of barriers in front of it, how do you maintain enthusiasm, especially when you're slugging through the dog days? That's a very good question. Um, I don't, I actually don't, I don't think there's one answer. So the first thing is, there are a set of, I sort of think about Isaiah on the leadership, this leadership front as concentric circles. And we're always trying to bring more people into the center, like through that process of leadership development. And, um, and that people are always reaching to that next layer of people and, and pulling them in. So there's a constant process all the time of new blood, new relationships, um, new people, which is incredibly important. So there's always this refresh. Secondly, if we do our work really well on the leadership development side, and people have the experience of finding their voice and their hunger and their own passion, they stop being in it for the issues and start being in it for the experience. 
And so we have people who have been a part of our organization for 25 years as volunteers. I'm sure the same thing is true in Together College. It, and those people um, have been so changed by their experience as part of that, I'm talking about that political community, and they don't get it anyplace else. <laughs> um, but through their congregation and through, and through Isaiah, that they stay for the long term. So I think the challenge is when there's so many competing agendas and interests, um, you know, we're trying to win this minimum wage, we're trying to do this, we're trying to do that, that we forget to do that other work that is slower and longer term, but ultimately the most important for sustainability. Um, hi, I'm Jeanette Jansen. I'm the Chief Nursing Officer for the State of Colorado and also the Health Equities Commission Commissioner, uh, one of the commissioners. And um, my question to you is, does data inform the people or do the people inform the data? <laughs> if you can talk about that a little bit, please. Well, I can, I can take a shot at that. So um, we have had some experiences uh, working to partner both with the department, both our state and our local health departments, as well as research partners um, to do the work. And our goal is to do the work in a way that the, it's not like we're changing what's true. We're not changing the data. The data is the data but that people have a directive relationship with what data is important to them and what their agenda is. So that there's also that, those last three questions I asked is like, do I have any agency in relationship to the information? And are people given the opportunity to understand how it can be used and how it can be powerful? So that is a challenge. We had that challenge when we did the health impact assessment. <laughs> um, had some of that challenge in other settings where we're, we're trying to translate data. But, I, but when we do the work right, where people really feel like this is helping me build what I'm trying to build and I have an equitable relationship with either a technical provider or, the, or a, a partner in an agency, it becomes very, very potent. <laughs> like the way people are, become imaginative and use the data in ways that advance their, advance their interests and what it is they'd like to see happen. I wonder if I could, uh, I wanted to make a comment as well. So um, uh, Bob Ross is the president and CEO of, of the California Endowment, and he just gave a keynote a couple, or a couple months ago for a, grass, uh, for a place based grant making conference. And he was talking about um, data. And w one of the things he said is the California Endowment had to rethink the approach they were taking to evaluation, recognizing that stories and narrative were actually part of evaluation and outcomes. And he has this great phrase in the talk, which is available online, where he says, we've come to the conclusion that we will have no data without stories and no stories without data. So the combination of how those intersect, and I know in your position you recognize that under the gold dome, where you heard I made maybe a comment or two, uh, <laughs> the most powerful impact is stories from real people. So I was a bureaucrat, a bureaucratic physician, terrible phrase, for nine years. And uh, the people who would come from the community and engage with their story in the committee hearing rooms had more power than anyone else. So I, I say that both to tell you the importance of data with stories and to try to inspire people to get involved because you really do have power and we have power that we don't even know about. So I think maybe Amy was. Hi, my name's Amy Downs. I'm from the Colorado Health Institute and thanks for that excellent presentation. Um, I thought you did a really great job of, you, were, you started the presentation talking about these systemic issues around p money and power, and then great examples of how community organizing at the local level can address some of that. And I'm just wondering about the intersection between community organizing and systemic solutions regarding income distribution and who has the power. And so specifically, I'm thinking about like the Supreme Court decision over how campaigns can be financed and you know to what extent do you think about these systemic issues that can help all sorts of communities 
um, communities that don't have organizations like ASEA, um, and, and how you think about that? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, so to peel back the veil a little bit more, I think that the field of community organizing um, across the board, so organizations like PICO, but there's, you know, there's a whole field of people who are doing different kinds of organizing and talking to each other. In the last 10 years that I've been involved, this is one of the primary struggles and questions that people are asking. So, so much of where some of this work came from, or even labor, or it's like you have local power that you can wield, so the economy was more local, or the company town, so there was like one plant and it was there, you, I mean, how do you, you can organize that plant and leverage economic power? We're not in that situation anymore, given the arrangement of power globally, or even in the country. So what I know is that in order for there to be uh, a change in something like Citizens United, or how the large financial institutions operate, or how trade agreements <laughs> happen, there has to, it's connected somehow to the process that I'm describing where people have more and more and more agency and power and sense of imagination that they can do something about it, but how we knit everything together so that it adds up to having enough clout to go after things like that and that uh, people all the way down the line can understand it and attach themselves to it. Like why does Citizens United impact my life? For a lot of people is a long leap. I mean, that's a, that's a long path. But there are really deep conversations happening about this question in our field, and I think there's gonna be a lot of evolution in the next 10 years to try to understand how to respond to exactly what you're saying. Thank you very much, and I wanna echo the comment that I haven't heard as inspiring a presentation in I can't tell you how long. Thank you very, very much for being here. And thanks to the Trust for making it possible. I wanna talk I'm so excited to hear somebody talk about power in public. I can't even stand it. <laughs> but in Colorado, as we um, struggle with building a voice of power, we're, we're constantly challenged that where is the business community, right? And, and I think the business community is an odd phrase. I think businesses are just as diverse. The business community is diverse as any other community, but I won't go down that path. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you engage what I'm going to call private sector economic interests in your power building structure? Because my experience is when you start to talk about power, it quickly turns into taking from one group and giving to another, and it tends to be that those private sector economic interests are the ones that feel as if they're giving it up. So can you talk about the integration of that as part of your strategy? And again, thank you so much for queuing up a conversation about power. So that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to figure out where to start. So, I, so the business community, again, it's not a monolith, and a lot of times it's used as a phrase. Um, so there's no distinction between small business owners and Wells Fargo when it comes to advancing the interests of the business, especially when I think about being under the dome. So the chamber and the um, large scale business lobbying organizations, I'm, saying, I'm trying to, now I'm really feeling like I'm on TV, so. <laughs> they, they lobby on the interests of very large scale business. Um, so we have done some work, particularly, but more tactically in, in, in the context of campaigns where we've built small business cohorts. Um, so we did that very systematically on healthcare reform in our state. So we had countless small business owners in congregations that were members of Isaiah, you know, who ran, and small business meaning up to like five or 600 people might be employees who the, the business owners themselves might have identified themselves as um, you know, economic conservatives, but when it came to advocating for healthcare reform on the interests of small businesses, we could build common ground, like very easily build common ground. Um, and I think we need to do a lot more of that. Um, 
actually organize, like organize small business owners and people in the business community and not assume that it's somehow off the table or it's always going to be oppositional because I don't, I don't think it is at all. So that's my short answer. We could talk longer about that. We'll go here. Okay. Ken Connell, uh, health advocate, activist. Uh, I'm trying to clarify in my head how the community organizing approach that you've used so successfully and presented in a very refreshing manner <laughs> might be distinguished from social movement building. And the reason I ask this is I've been involved with a number of organizations, and very often the organization's interest yeah. become an obstacle, and maybe for reasons Carol's suggesting, yeah. that power sharing is not power sharing, it's power giving or losing or gaining yeah. for organizations. And I, I've tried to distinguish uh, social movement building as not being so tied to organizations and their interests finding a common path, yeah. but a much broader base of people who say enough is enough is enough. It's time for health equity, whether that's through universal health care yeah. or, or whatever the solutions might be. Yeah. So um, I think sometimes there's a um, unuseful, or an unused, that's not a word, um, a not useful binary between organization building and movement building. The reason the binary exists is some of the things you're saying are true, that historically the organization building side of the kind of organizing movement, organizations can become calcified, they can get lost in their own interests, they might need to go away. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's all kinds of pitfalls in the path to organization building where that fresh button isn't pushed or new people aren't in or it gets then controlled by a small group of interests. So that can happen. But every major social movement, if you get under the hood, was a productive tension between movements of people and people doing movement building and systematic organization building. So even if you look at the relationship between SNCC, the student movement and civil rights movement, and um, the SCLC, there was a lot of tension between those organizations. It was actually productive tension. And, and that, you know, the kind of more social movement, direct action, escalating mobilization, which SCLC did as well, but in a, in a slightly different way. It was, the, it was the interaction between those things that could capture the movement moment that was happening in the night, which was also organized for, for you know, hundreds of years. But that I, I think organizing, organization people have a lot to learn from movement builders. And I think, again, like right now in the kind of more traditional community organizing is doing a lot more thinking about how do we relate to movements? How do you maybe spin things out that have their own identity that you're not trying to capture, but they, they're, they're doing something that you as the organization can't do. There's a division of labor. How do we really think strategically about all those things? But I don't think it's either or. Thank you. Elaine has an internet question. Yeah, there was someone from the, the southwest part of the state who wrote in um, commenting on how successful Isaiah has been over the years, and they were wondering how Isaiah remains financially sustainable. Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, so we have a mix of what we call like hard money. So members are donors and congregations pay dues. It is pro it's only about 15% of our budget and the rest comes from, um, philanthropy, local and national philanthropy. Um, through various channels. So sometimes I'm um, part of the soapbox moment I had about people want to pay for the outcome but not for the capacity building is part of the dynamic that happens and struggle in us being financially sustainable and um, you know getting uh, grants from philanthropic partners but making sure that that doesn't move all of our energy towards running a bunch of different campaigns or projects and not doing the work that really makes Isaiah successful, which is this long-term leadership development and base building work. 
and it's a chronic challenge and it's a struggle for Isaiah and that's a struggle for most base building community organizing and movement building organizations in the, in the country. It's actually a problem that needs to be solved. W wonderful talk, really enjoyed it, so thank you. I feel privileged to have heard that. And I, I work for Delta Dental of Colorado Foundation. We're a nonprofit, and we have a public well-building campaign here in Colorado because, as many in the room may know, uh, when you're talking about oral health, tremendous disparities, yeah. uh, especially among uh, the Hispanic community as far as early childhood caries, et cetera. So we're trying to build public well on this issue and trying to close the gap on those disparities so that kids can realize their potential. We have an ad campaign, but beyond that, we really want to get into community organizing, and we're actually looking at a particular area of Denver where we're going to, where we're going to do that, in addition to another area of the state. And my question for you is, it's kind of around the topic of sustainability, but beyond tapping into passion, how do you incentivize some of this, this volunteer force that you're trying to build? Are there incentives? I mean, obviously, passion is the most important part of it. But incentives, what's the role of incentives? Is there even a role? And how do you do that with an eye towards sustainability? And when you're talking about incentives, can you say one more sentence about what you mean by that? Like, are you talking about like financial incentives or? Something to incentivize maybe um, a volunteer workers who are out there having contact with families yeah. like, you know, whether it's w something that we've explored is like gift cards for every con family you contact or something like that. I mean, how do you, is there a role for incentives or is that just, you don't even want to go there? Mm, I'm never very rigid about anything because, you know, there's always exceptions to every rule. <laughs> I would say that sustainability requires that people's or orientation towards the work changes from I'm a consumer or a task person to I am an owner and a leader. And if you don't flip the switch around agency, the per it simply is not sustainable. So that agency, you know, I was trying to put a little window into that process of, of flipping that switch in people about agency. Meaning like, I'm doing this because it's about me and my family and the stakes for me, and this is my, what's happening around me, these other volunteers and this organization is my organization, and I'm trying, I know where I am and where I'm positioned and what I'm trying to do. And so, so without that piece, you can't, you can't build an organization, and I would argue you can't really build a movement either. Now, if you don't want it to be sustainable, meaning there's something left behind in terms of like an organization or an organizing project in which it's growing and it's being fed and it's refreshing, there are, there are also skills and practices inside the process of community organizing that may not build an organization that, that I've described but could definitely be more effective engagement. So I think there's actually a spectrum that's worth really thinking through. And part of what I encourage people to do who are, like you're saying, we wanna do X, Y, and Z on oral health, is do you understand what the different options are on that spectrum? And what decision, intentional decision are you making about this is what we're trying to do? And inside that whole spectrum, there's a bunch of tools and ways of orienting yourself because it can make you more effective N not being um not being all or nothing about it do you understand what i'm saying yes. so that might be worth thinking through in this particular situation thank you another thank you um i appreciated your presentation and and um your uh, some specific points for me personally. Um, I am Janice Nolan, and I have worked with organizations most of my life, both as an internal practitioner and as a consultant in organization effectiveness. And my, um, I seem to show up at these uh, wonderful events from the trust and ask the same question, only different ways. I, my concern about organizations is how do we begin to change 
the structure of organizations so that they are flatter, more participative, and democratic. And I, like you, um, I get on my little uh, soapbox about there's a methodology here. It just doesn't happen. And that's been my training and my background. So what I guess my question is how when so many people have grown up in organizations that are bureaucratic, you know, based on that industrial model, um, hierarchy, functional, yeah. not functional hierarchy, but power hierarchy, the award systems are in place to keep the power in a certain level, on and on and on. How does, how do we begin to change, flip the switch, as you say, so that people who've grown up in these organizations begin to believe there are alternatives? And how have you maybe experienced that in shaping your organizations? Um, and I guess one, one additional thing is that uh, specifically, you mentioned this um, minimum wage, and I, I'm curious how, what the coordinating mechanism might have been for that. Oh, for the campaign. Yeah. So, several things, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. So, I think the question about how, to, about how organizations become more democratic, um, I've thought some about this as we've intersected more and more with agencies or um, uh, kind of or large scale social service nonprofits, which you know people do really effective work, and it's not like that's all. It's not all bad, um, but if there is an imperative that in order for us to be successful, we have to do something different in relationship to how we're relating to quote unquote, the community, which I put in quotes because that's a, that's a big mushy word we use. <laughs> it's like, who are we actually talking about? So that being said, I think it's very, very difficult to undo, you know, probably 60 years of practice. So I, I'm, I'm saying 60 years because I think there was actually a moment, even in like labor unions where a service model became actually the paradigm, it's industrial and it's also a service model. It's like there are consumers and clients and we serve them. We get money to execute a program and they're the clients of the program. So, or schools, we are an expert, professionalized teach. It's a professionalization of all of these fields. So to dismantle professionalization and say, as a teacher, what if you're a public citizen teacher? Or if I'm a social worker, what does it mean to be a organizer social worker, which means my relationships with people stop being I'm doing this with you, but like actually we're on, the, we're co-equal and I'm trying to actually build your capacity and power to know what you want. <laughs> like that that's, it's an extraordinarily different paradigm. Now what it takes to transform large-scale bureaucracies to think more that way or systematically implement that, I, I don't know if I have the answer beyond there would probably need to be someone at the top who really says, we're gonna do this, and then number two, systematic retraining. And then ways of creating accountability around that kind of retraining and that the people themselves, like the people who are being trained, like I'm a service worker or a civil servant, what am I gonna get out of that? And I would argue you'll get a lot. Like you would, you yourself then, then get to be part of it as opposed to away from it. So like I, if I'm a, I could be a part of the transformation. I'm not a server of it or a, you know, you know, executor of a program. And I wonder if there's something in that passion and motivation piece, because I think a lot of people get into these fields because they really do want to make a difference. So that's, those are some thoughts I've had about it. But my own run-ins with large-scale bureaucracies, I certainly do not underestimate <laughs> the challenge of changing it. I, I think it's an extraordinary challenge for actually all of our communities and countries because it's not, that, that model isn't gonna work for the problems of the future, the problems for now. Anyway, 
So I recognize you have about three more questions and about that much time. Okay. So I'm going to start with Julian. I'll be shorter too. Uh, Jessica wrote in asking, how do you handle polarizing topics among faith organizations? Like, I guess it's on Twitter, so we don't know. Don't know. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, like choice or gay rights. Um, so that's, some of those issues are very challenging for us as a faith-based organization. Um, I would say that we've had, like inside Isaiah, this is part of the imperfection of organization building rather than movement building. There's certain things we do not work on because we do not have common ground in our constituency to work on them. So an example would be reproductive rights. Um, which is not to say we can't work on issues that, that, that help women, but we do not have a stance on abortion or choice, and we don't you know, get too far down the path on reproductive rights, um, which is um, we have a very large Catholic constitu constituency, and that struggle inside the Catholic Church limits our ability to have that struggle publicly. Um, on gay rights, there's a lot of progress that has been made in the faith community. Um, it's not only contested, but contested in a way in which there is a, there's a big move. I, 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 the last 10 years have been like a sea change inside faith communities about how people think about gay rights and how it's a faith issue and a justice issue. Um, it's still a struggle in our organization. Um, with people who have more fundamentalist theologies, uh, and there's a race struggle inside that question. Um, with at the, the Baptist Convention, for example, has a conservative position on, um, on gay rights. So what we try to do is have those conversations very explicitly. So if it comes up and there's struggle of people having different views on those things, we construct very intentional spaces, political community, where people can have a very honest conversation with one another about the stakes for them and their stories around it and what it means to be part of this organization and what the consequences would be. So that's what we try to do to navigate some of those, those issues, but it's, those, those issues are challenging. Um, hi, Doran. Thank you so very much. I'm, I'm from Together Colorado, Yay. so thank you so much. Hello. Uh, one of the, you already shared with us the population that you work with. Yeah. So how are you explicitly including a racial lens in your healthcare yeah. work? In our healthcare work. Yeah. <clears throat> because I see healthcare as a poster child for disparities around race. Yes. So we do use an explicit racial lens. We try to use it, we, we work on using an explicit racial lens in all of our work. Um, and we operate primarily from a, um, an analysis about structural racism. Um, we've worked with the Applied Research Center, John Powell, with PICO has been a huge influence and on our leaders and staff around how to do that. Um, on the health side, part of it is that we explicitly talk about health inequities are created by structural racism. And so an example of how we've, like another project we did with our health department, um, I'd say the health department did it in, we and other organizations were a part of it, is they actually put out a report that said the health inequities in Minnesota are caused by structural racism. And Commissioner Ellinger went all over the state talking about structural racism and defined what structural racism meant and was on NPR you know, for hours talking about structural racism and connecting income, wealth, education, that in all of these categories, we have this gap, and that gap is caused by structural racism. <laughs> and you would be, a lot of people were scared that he was gonna do this. Since I'm in Colorado, I can say the governor was scared that he was gonna do this. <laughs> and it had such a positive response. I mean, so communities felt, I mean, as you can imagine, having a public commissioner, a white guy who wears a bow tie, it looks totally like your family, white guy family doctor, nice. But talk about structural racism from that platform was an extraordinarily relieving and empowering experience for people all over the state. So that, that's an example of like, how do you just put it right there explicitly on the table and like let people wrestle with it and see what it unleashes. 
Does that help? Okay. I want to uh, thank Doran one more time. <laughs> Thank you.